All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Welcome. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we usually uh, start our day uh, here in ECHO with uh, just a quick roll call of all the teams to make sure that we know who's on the call for um, each time we get together. And so um, we'll ask the program director or if the program director isn't on, if there's someone who can just kind of do a verbal like, hello, we're here kind of thing. We won't ask that you introduce everyone on your team. However, if, you, if there's anyone new who has not yet been able to introduce themselves, this is a nice opportunity to be able to have somebody introduce themselves to the full network since we only get together about once a month. Um, and then we'll do some quick announcements and then shift over to our featured presenter, Lauren Gehring, today. And then um, for the last half of our time together, we'll um, focus on our um, case presentation with Cascade. And I think, Amber, you and your team are going to present for that, right? Okay. Sounds good. So um, let's get started here is so it looks like we've got Cascade on. <laughs> Hopefully. We are here and we have a new peer. Great. Do you want to have that person introduce? Uh, yes. I, well, Zach, there he is. Hi there. My name is Zach and Guillaume. I'm the new peer support counselor for the New Journeys team here in Centralia. <laughs> oh, great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Sounds good. And we'll hear more from you and your team uh, toward the end. How about BHR's two teams? Yes, I see both my staff from Thurston Mason and Grace Harbor. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Catholic Charities. Yeah, we're here. Um, we do have a new IRT, which I don't see her on here, but her name's Annabelle. She'll okay. probably be logging in later on, or I might have to help her log on. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, that's good to know. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, how about comprehensive health care in Yakima? We are here, too. Um, Victor should be logging on here in a little bit. Um, okay, great. We... Okay, sounds good. Thank you. How about uh, comprehensive health care in Pasco? Hello, I'm here, Daisy, the IRT specialist. Great. Thanks, Daisy. How about Frontiers two teams, teams one and two? We're here. Yes, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Eric and Sarah. How about Kitsap Mental Health Services? Anyone from Kitsap here today? No, not yet. Okay. Let's see, do we have Ryther? represented today. We're here. Yes. Thanks, Sherry. Okay, great. Sherry and Max. Seamar in Vancouver. Anyone from Seamar today? Looks like... yes. Hi, um, Heather's not in the office on Wednesdays, so she's not here, but I am here today and joining by phone. Okay, great. Welcome. And I think, Tristan, you just logged in from Kitsap. Okay, yes. Great. How about Step? Hi, we are here. And I can't remember if I introduced our intern last month, Allison Schwartz. Fantastic to have her with us. Great. Welcome, Allison. All right. How about Valley Cities? Hi, Maria. We're all here. Okay, thanks, Patty. You're welcome. Uh, Lummi Tribal Health Clinic. Anyone from Lummi? Not today. Okay, what about Peninsula Peninsula Behavioral Health? Uh, I think I'm the only one here today, but I'm here. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jackie. Welcome. Uh, CMAR in Snohomish County. Yep, we are here. All right, thanks, Hannah. How about Lucid Living? I think we've got you guys Hello. on. Yeah, Dr. Greg is here, program director. And I think we have our prescriber, Dr. Jones. We have RC specialist, Spacey. And we also have our new peer, Stevie, all on the call. Their camera's off today. Oh, Observing. okay. Great. Terrific. Um, let's see. Lifeline Connections in Whatcom County. And I think you guys have some new people. 
And no, I'm here. Um, I don't think the rest of the team is here. And I'm a new prescriber with them, just joining them. Sorry about the camera. It's not working for some reason. So um, there's at least one person. Okay, great. Thanks, Rita. Welcome aboard. Let's see. Do we have Clarvita represented today? We are here. We just have a couple team members um, having some technical difficulties, but um, yeah, at least we're here. Two out yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Sounds great. Hi, Kel Kellen? 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 And Kellen, yeah. Kellen. Okay, and Emily. Sounds great. Um, all right. Anyone that I missed from the teams or who joined late after we went through you already? Brian is here. We joined late. We just had another meeting that just okay. ended. Okay. Sounds good. No problem, Leanne. Welcome. Let's see, do we have anyone from HCA today? Sonia or Becky? Not today, okay. Well, let's see, um, WSU, anyone from WSU today? Not today, okay. So let's um, shift into our UW uh, implementation training team. So I'm Maria Monroe DeVita, and I provide overall support for the New Journeys Network and uh, previously supported the pro program directors and uh, family education specialists, and now uh, do a lot more kind of overview training um, within the network. Uh, Akansha, you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Akansha Maswani Pai. Uh, and I am a counseling psychologist by training with the UW um, implementation um, team for the first episode psychosis, and I support the family education specialists. Great. Thanks, Akansha. And I know you've got Nanak there um, helping you out too today. Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> homesick, so oh, I might be distracted, always... everybody. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Thanks for still joining. Cami, you want to go? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Cami Peretta. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I provide training and consultation to our program directors. And Kyle. Hello, everyone. Kyle Payne. I provide training and consultation as well as support to the C-specialists for New Journeys. It's great to see everyone here. And Steve. Hey, guys. Uh, Steve Smith, uh, clinical psychologist, and I provide support to the IRT clinicians. And Lauren, I know I'm going to do a longer intro to you in a second, but do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Hello, I'm Lauren, and I get to support the peer specialists on the New Journey teams. More on that very soon. Uh, Carolyn. Hello, I'm Carolyn Brenner. I'm a psychiatrist at UW and Harborview, and I do training and consultation for the psychiatric care providers. And then we've got McKinsey. Hi, everyone. Mackenzie Tennyson, Research Coordinator with the Spirit Center, providing back-end support for training and ECHO, all those kind of things. Great to see everyone. And Cameron, who you guys will be hearing more and more from. Hi, I'm Cameron. I'm also Research Coordinator here at the Spirit Center at UW, um, providing similar support like Mackenzie. And then we've got our new postdoctoral fellow, John. You want to introduce yourself, John? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm John Fitzgerald. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, currently serving as a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Dr. Monroe DeVita. So nice to uh, meet you all. And doing some CAPS evals, too. So yes. just a quick plug for that as well. So, all right, great. Anybody who didn't get a chance to introduce themselves today, um, whether your team hasn't been called or you represent a, a different interest as you've joined us today. Okay, sounds good. Well, any in uh, announcements that folks want to share? Anyone from the training team or from the teams themselves where you want to use this as an opportunity to make sure to cast a wide net with whatever announcement you have? We'll remind everyone at the end, but I just wanted to set out a reminder that our next Echo is off schedule on December 11th due to the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, other holidays around that time, just to keep everyone's eyes there. Yeah, good point. 
uh, won't be during the regular time. And then Mackenzie, I know you sent out also um, the registration for those who do screening within the teams um, to do differential uh, diagnosis. Yes, that training yes. is on October 29th. So that was sent out to program directors and prescribers to send out to anyone else on the team who does uh, assessment and screening. If you didn't receive that link and would like to, please message me in the chat or email me and I'll make sure to get that to you if you haven't seen it. And again, the idea here is that um, since we're expanding the admission criteria to include effective psychosis, we are um, providing some training on that day to focus on um, on that particular population uh, in addition to the non-effective psychosis side of things that we've been focusing on before now. Um, any other announcements? Okay. Why don't we shift into then our presenter of the day, um, Lauren Gehring. Lauren is an advocate. I know you guys know Lauren, by the way, many of you, but I, I love this bio Lauren um, has here and I wanna make sure you guys all hear more about her today. Um, she deserves a lot of credit for everything that she has done in our state beyond what you all know her to do in supporting our New Journeys peers. Um, Lauren is an advocate within the behavioral health system since the age of 14 when she grew frustrated with not having a voice in her own life and treatment. She began advocating for individuals to have their voices heard and choices known within their own lives as well as in the systems that serve them. Lauren was one of the founders of Youth Move National and has worked with systems of care communities nationwide to integrate youth voice and peers into service delivery and organizational governance. She is the proud recipient of the 2011 Voice Award for Excellence in the Field of Youth Advocacy, the 2012 Marlene Matteris Advocate for Youth Rockstar Award, that's very fitting, Lauren, and the 2019 Innovative Treatment Solutions Coach of the Year Award. In 2021, Lauren founded the company The Rainbow Makers and runs Washington State's Peer Workforce Development Conference. Through this work, she also hosts the annual leadership events for peers and is the convener of Our Voice Collective, a statewide recovery organization funded through the Office of Community Voice and Engagement. Lauren is also the recovery services manager for We Connect and supervises a team of peer supporters and peer supervisors. Lauren is an enthusiastic coffee and tea drinker and an award-winning karaoke singer, proudly and passionately holding a first place award for quote, best worst karaoke experience, end quote. And I turn it over to you, Lauren. Thank you. You got to be proud of the awards that you have. And that karaoke one was uh, definitely my my pride, pride and joy. As I'm sharing this, I'll just say they brought, uh, it was the worst performance they'd seen of the night, but it brought the most passion. So sometimes where we lack talent, we can make up for and uh, passion and energy. So I try to bring that. All right, let me go ahead and share my slides here. Stand by for screen sharing, please. Lauren, okay. can I ask which song you sang? It makes it so much worse. Uh, my brother and I, he did spoken word while I belted out Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You in honor of my sister who loves that song. So it was, it was passionate to say the least. All right, can y'all see my slides? Okay, great. So... Some of the information I'm going to share with you, I've already shared, and then we're going to shift. And I'm also going to talk a little bit more um, about the changes that are coming, as well as some additional resources that exist for you as organizations, um, especially if you're new. I know some of you have uh, had peers in your service delivery for a long time, and some of you are kind of integrating and might be a little bit more new to this. And I want to make sure that you know of the free resources that exist to you as an agency when it comes to supporting peers. So we're going to just dive in here and talk a little bit about the requirements for the youth peer role. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because we have talked about this in the past, but really it's to be a person with lived experience in behavioral health as a young person. So to be a youth peer, you have to have had that lived experience as a youth and really to have the ability to model boundaries while also establishing a relationship of mutuality. And we're gonna unpack a little bit about what that means to have a relationship of mutuality. And you'll notice I said model boundaries while having a relationship of mutuality. So it's really important to be able to do both those things and to make sure that those are tied together. Now. 
one of the things that's important is just having lived experience is not enough. You know, sometimes we say, oh, well, we need to find somebody that has the, the same lived experience. And that's not necessarily the case because you're never going to have the same lived experience as somebody. Even if you have the same diagnosis, even if you've experienced an altered state or psychosis, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily the best person to be working with them. So make sure that when you're writing job descriptions and when you're doing interviews, lived experience is not the only criteria. It's one. It's one, and it's definitely the foundation for where all the other tools land. But we want to make sure that we're hiring and supporting people to grow and to gain additional skills that they're going to use because using their lived experience to connect is one of the tools in the toolbox. Um, and it's important. There's no age. Like we don't say, well, you must hire somebody between 18 and 25 to be a youth peer. There's not a set age. What it really is, is being able to hire and have people in these roles that have an understanding and that have an interest in youth culture. So who can either relate or ask good questions um, and connect with young people. So that's what we're really looking for, are people who want to work with youth, have an interest in youth culture. And I've said this before, but when you're hiring folks, ask the youth you serve for questions. If you're not going to have them on the interview panel, and honestly, I think this is great to do with every role, um, do a survey with the youth you work with. What do you think is important for a youth peer? Who would you want to work with? What questions would you ask them? You know, that's one thing that we do in our agency. We're hiring right now, actually. And um, we do a poll with the people that we work with and ask them what's important to them with a peer. And then we take that information and we add at least two questions into the interview that are driven by the people that we serve. Um, and we've started doing that with almost all of our roles. So I really encourage you to look at that as you're hiring. And then making sure that they're comfortable working with individuals that are experiencing psychosis and altered states. I get the privilege of working with a lot of peers, and I can tell you that not everybody is comfortable doing that. And so talking about what that can look like, some of the common things that people are going to come up against in the interview also gives people the opportunity to say, you know what, that might not be for me. Um, especially if they don't have that lived experience. So really making sure that people understand, um, you know, both the challenges and the awesome opportunities that come with working with people um, that experience psychosis. So just wanted to put that out for really the requirements. And then we're going to talk more about the shifting requirements for certification that are coming based on recent legislation. So key to our role are really these SAMHSA core competencies. Um, as the state is looking at, um, you know, changing the peer certification, uh, as they're making shifts with that, one of the things that they're doing, and I'm also one of the co-writers and trainers for this, is they're developing a peer supervisor training. So uh, they're training people who are going to be supervising peers. Right now, it's going to be for peers that are becoming peer supervisors, but a lot of folks are really advocating that it be something that's opened up to all peer supervisors, including clinicians. So we're kind of hoping that we can get that uh, put out there. At the very least, it'll be integrated into some of the other TA that HC is offering. But when we look at doing those kind of trainings, everything goes back to these core competencies. When I supervise the team of peers that I do at WeConnect, we review these core competencies. In our team meeting, at least once a month, I say, okay, you know what? It's time that we pull up our core competencies and let's talk about this. How are we doing? Because supervision and their roles and how we really define fidelity to the peer role is right here. So as a supervisor, I have this on my desk as a reminder to check in with people about so the first piece with peer support is that it's recovery oriented. And hopefully everybody kind of recognizes what this means. We'll talk a little bit more, but um, it's really where we hold out hope for everybody we serve. I hear more from peers when they've worked with folks um, with psychosis that sometimes that can be hard, especially when it's something that people are dealing with or uh, where they may feel hopeless or where they may have been really grieving losing a lot in their lives. We hold out hope that they can find recovery as they define it, even if it looks different than what they previously thought. Um, and it's really building on strengths. This is one of my favorite parts of my role. And uh, this is one of the biggest things that I ask in supervision with the peers I supervise is what are their strengths, especially when they come to me and they're frustrated with somebody they're working with. What are their strengths? And if they say, I don't know, I ask, did they say hi to you? 
That's a strength, right? So as a supervisor, and we really want to get creative and pulling out those strengths. And as peers, we want to make sure that every single time we work with somebody, we find another strength. So I frequently ask people in their notes, I want to see a new strength or a strength that's growing in almost every single note that I look at, because we should always walk away from an interaction. If it's 30 minutes, I should walk away from an interaction being able to pull a strength, even if it initially feels superficial. Sometimes the most superficial strengths are the ones that can grow. They laugh a lot. Maybe they use humor to build relationships. Maybe comedy is a self-care thing that they can use when they're experiencing challenges. So really opening ourselves up to noticing those things, because often those small things are what can grow into really big supports for them as well. And then it's person-centered. So it's really recognizing that it's directed by the person. That's that mutuality piece. You know, we don't put our beliefs, our biases, um, our goals onto somebody else. Our job is really to support them to find their voice, their preferences, and to then be able to communicate those to the team. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. And then also that's voluntary. And this can be challenging, especially when folks are mandated into treatment. And I know there's some peers that work with folks that are mandated and some that don't. Um, but really, as much as possible, we try to maintain that mutuality by having it be, a, you know, voluntary to meet with peers. Um, ways that you can help so that people will want to meet with peers is by involving them in engagement and outreach up front. So again, also going to mention that on the next slide. And then it's relationship focused. It's really focused on getting to know the person, getting to know who they are, sharing stories with them. Uh, I like to say that we're friendly, but not friends. So we don't get to be friends, but we do get to be friendly and hear their stories and help them to bring that story or those stories, that experience, that expertise into the team meeting. And then trauma informed. And this is one that I find we don't often talk about enough and we often don't supervise to this enough. Um, peers, because they use their stories, to connect with other people, uh, there's a huge opportunity for vicarious trauma, especially if you're somebody who has been through the system and a lot of peers have experienced trauma from the system that they're now working in. So vicarious trauma is huge. And so really supporting people and talking about that, talking about what they do, you know, when they bump up against something that maybe hits too close to home. Um, talking about what they can do to create trauma-informed environments with the people that they're working with. And a big piece of that is by being establishing mutuality and not hierarchy. So I always say partnering with uh, or partnering you know, together and not over. Uh, but then also the other piece of being trauma-informed is being trauma-informed with themselves. Then that's really establishing those strong boundaries. It also means um, being trauma-informed with the people they work with. So ways that y'all can do that as a team member is never sharing somebody's story. You know, I had an experience early on when I was doing peer support where I was working on wraparound teams and a very well-meaning case manager was working with somebody and they had just exited a hospital um, for a suicide attempt. And they said, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Lauren, come over here. I'm so excited you're working on the team. Lauren was hospitalized for a suicide attempt as well. And I think she'd be a great fit to talk to you about, you know, to talk to you about that. I gotta be honest with y'all. Some days you wake up in the morning and you're like, I feel like talking about suicide today. It's just not my jam today. And so the ability to be able to hold your story and choose when to share it is huge. So even if you have information and you know some of the stories about your, uh, you know, the peer specialists on your team, never share those without consent. Even if you think, oh, by sharing this, it's going to help them to want to engage with the peer. Get the peer's permission. Say that to the peer and say, do you think this is something that I could share or you could share? Have a conversation about it. But that's how you can be trauma informed with the peers that you're working with. And when you introduce them, ask if there's aspects of their experience they want shared with the team. Never assume that just because they've disclosed to somebody that they're okay with you disclosing that. So I like to talk more than just about how peers can be trauma-informed, but how the team can really support them as well with that piece um, for themselves. And then just a reminder, supervisors, always, always make sure you're supervising to these competency and other team members, make sure that you're aware of them too.
So mutuality and fidelity to the role, this is so important. I've seen, especially for peers to love and enjoy their jobs when they're supervised to actually doing their jobs. So that shared experience and empathy, that's really that mutuality. Um, and what mutuality means in peer support is it's the idea that both the peer supporter and the person that they support have valuable lived experience. So if I'm coming to somebody to partner with them with mutuality, it means that I recognize that I also will learn from them. I can tell you all that my recovery from mental health and I've experienced psychosis in my life as well. My recovery is stronger because of working with other people because I learn about recovery from them. Every time I work with somebody, I walk away with something that has the opportunity to strengthen my recovery. The minute I think I am like the recovery fairy that comes in and sprinkles it and gives it to everybody is the minute that I should stop doing this work. So anytime we think that we are the holders of solutions for folks, it means that we're outside of mutuality and that we now view ourselves as the expert. So peers should always look at what can I also learn from this person? It's a mutual relationship. Um, and this is incredibly huge. Peers work with people, not clients or patients. Please support your peers. We'd say throw away the C word. That's clinical. That is clinical language. So if I'm talking about a client or a patient, I'm already separating from mutuality. I am not a clinician. I should not be supervised as a clinician. I should not be taking clinical notes. So make sure that peers make that shift. They work with peers, they work with people, they don't have clients and they don't have patients. And this is really big. Uh, I was actually recently in a meeting with um, some peer organizations and behavioral health clinics across the country. And they talked about how problematic it is when peers are handing out or tracking medication clients. It is so outside of their role. That is something that peers should never, ever, ever, it's a liability, number one. Um, so it's a huge liability and it totally separates you from mutuality. If I'm now in charge of your med compliance, how am I going to be able to have very real and transparent conversations with how you feel about medication? Or you talking to your provider about medication? you planning for those things. I'm now in a hierarchical relationship with you, which is completely outside the core competencies. So I cannot stress enough that that's very much outside of a peer role. Um, and so I would ask you why? What, what other challenges do you think can occur if we have peers that are tracking med compliance? Does anybody want to share? You could drop in the chat or put your hand up. Why is that a challenging thing to have peers do? All right, yeah, Jackie. Because it's outside of our scope of practice, we shouldn't be talking about medications because that's a med provider's um, role and not ours. Yeah, absolutely. And it edges into clinical, like clinical support. Um, even if you're not providing it, you're still providing clinical support that sometimes case aides and other folks provide. So we have to ensure that we are not or putting ourselves in a clinical role. Um, so moving on from that, I want to be very aware of time here. So peer notes should be written using strength-based and recovery-oriented language, including any interventions used. Now, peers do not have to share in every note that they've shared their story unless they've done that. I've heard sometimes this is a common misconception um, where they're, well, every time the peers have to say they've shared their story. It's not necessarily true. It's like any intervention they use. If I use motivational interviewing, I'm going to share that. If I shared an aspect of my story, that's all I have to put in there is share lived experience around blah, blah, blah. Um, and not every note may have that shared lived experience because guess what? Not every time, sometimes it's not applicable. And then this is another one that I found a lot of times gets confusing. Peers can run groups and bill Medicaid. That is something that peers are able to do. And what that looks like is they cannot be clinical in nature. So I can't be running clinical groups, but I can run activity groups. I can run support groups and it's one peer per 12 participants. So you cannot go over 12 participants unless you have another peer that's there. So just wanted to make sure folks knew that that is the requirement in terms of peer running, peers running groups. Um, we talked about meds, but also peers do not encourage or discourage individuals from taking medication. So we never tell a peer like, hey, try to get them to get back on these meds. 
what you can say is, can you find out how they're feeling and what their barriers or what the challenges are, you know, for them around this? That we can do, but we cannot take a stance one way or another. And really peers specialize in outreach, engagement, and being a cultural bridge. Sometimes this is what creates challenges on teams because I have to have one foot in the team and one foot with the peer, and I have to help the translation between both the system language and the goals and the needs here and the same thing with the peer. So sometimes I might be supporting a peer to advocate for themselves and it might be something the team doesn't want, but it's still my role to support them on how to vocalize that. So make sure that you're supporting each other and recognizing that the if a peer is, you know, your peer specialist is working with somebody to have their voice and it's against maybe the goal that the team wanted, that doesn't mean that the peer is against you. It means they're doing their role. And so having that good communication between teams is really, really important so that everybody knows like, hey, this is my job to be doing this and I can still be a supportive team member as well. And transition planning. Uh, also, the peers I know who have the most job satisfaction are the ones that are supported to bring the fun, bring the creativity, celebrate the work. You know, and just a quick example of that, um, I've shared this with the peers just the other day, actually, but uh, I worked with somebody who her goal was to stop um, self-harming, and it had been years since she had stopped, and I hadn't seen her, and we had this whole plan in place that involved like scratch and sniff french fry stickers because she wanted to get french fries when she got something, and uh, I went, and she was so sad because she only made it one day, she said, and I was like, wait, hold up, you made it a day? day before we get into anything else we need to celebrate that and we plan this big celebration around that and then 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 we talked about okay how do we make it another day so making sure that you're celebrating before sometimes even shifting into the second plan so really bring fun this is hard work that we're doing and peers get to bring a little bit of light and energy into that and make it as fun as possible get creative with how you connect with people um, and then this is key, and I want to share how this is going to actually become a requirement. Fidelity also involves continually educating themselves about best practices. This means connecting with other peers to stay current. Things like peer pathways, webinars take place. You can get on the listserv with HCA. They send out opportunities. The Washington Peer Network. I would encourage every peer to be on there because they post regular training and different opportunities. And what's going to be happening with the new certification that's going to launch in 2025, peers, once they go through that, and in order to bill Medicaid, um, peers will be required to go through that training. I believe they have till the end of 2026 to continue billing Medicaid without the new certification. However, after 2026, they will not be able to bill Medicaid anymore. So don't wait till the end to have your peers get certified. If they're already certified, they're just gonna go through a bridge training. I believe that will be offered virtually. But once that rolls out, I believe that's gonna be in July, 2025, not sure the exact date, have them get in there early because everyone's gonna be trying to do it. So don't wait till the very end and then have a challenge where your peers can't bill Medicaid come January 1st, 2027. But part of that new requirement, and this will also kick in, I think you have up until the end of 2026, peers are going to have to have 30 hours of continuing education every two years. There's some requirements about what that'll be. I can give you all the link to find those on DOH's site. Um, but start planning for that because I know some agencies don't budget for peers continuing ed because they say it's not a requirement, which spoiler, it actually still is a requirement. However, it's not tracked, whereas now you're going to be very uh, accountable and tracked for that. So you're going to want to budget for that. They'll be able to get continuing eds through conferences and through a variety of places. But this is incredibly important. Okay. I know I'm going over, so I'm going to end with talking about operationalizing peer support. This is a resource okay, that's... by the way. You're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a resource that's available to you. Um, this is run through HCA. Naomi Herrera is incredible, and she's the one who does this training. Um, and what this training is, is it's for agencies to really have a good understanding about how to integrate, support, and supervise peers, to understand billing, uh, to understand what peers can and cannot do. And there's a lot of different offerings. It's a free resource. Love those. 
that can be offered in a two-day, four-day, or a quarterly series. So I put the information on there for you, and we can email it out. I also have a flyer that we can email out. Um, I'll drop it in the chat, too. But it, um, you can get on their listserv, and that very long-winded um, uh, thing on the bottom, I'll drop the link in chat, too, after this. But you can get on the listserv and they'll send out training dates. They also do regular webinars, especially with the changes coming. I would highly recommend that you get on there so that you're up to date with the different dates, changes, requirements for peers, as well as requirements for peer supervision. You're going to want to make sure that you know that so that you're not, like I said, in a jam where you end up going, oh my gosh, how come our peer can't bill Medicaid now because they never got the new credential? So that's going to be really, really essential. Um, and just lastly, I really want to encourage y'all to also, it's not just about peers continuing to grow. There's resources out there for supervisors and team members on how to best integrate with peers on teams. And a lot of that comes from really making sure that peers are meeting with folks, that they, they have the opportunity to engage, and that every single team member has an elevator speech knowing how to describe peer, peer support, um, especially if it is something that's offered optionally for folks. I would encourage y'all, what is your elevator speech? How do you describe it to people? How do you tailor it? I have an elevator speech, and then I tweak it depending on who I'm talking to and what their experience and what kind of their hook might be. So talk about that as a team and make sure that you know how to describe that in a way that, you know, people are going to want to meet with them and give it a chance. So with just a couple minutes, does anybody have any specific questions that I can answer or tell you I can't answer? Lauren, I had a question and I may have heard you wrong about the change. Um, yeah. So you're saying... Are you saying that peers, when they complete the certified peer group training, that they won't be able to bill Medicaid even after they complete that in the future? Or that the it's current a... training? So peers who are certified right now with this you will, current with this current certification. So that includes me. I have a Washington State certification. I am going to have to go through what's going to be called like the bridge training which okay. will then allow me to, it'll supplement information um, that is not in the current certification, then I will be allowed to bill Medicaid. But yes, I will have until 2026, the end of 2026, to get the new certification. At that time, under my current certification, I will no longer be able to bill Medicaid. Okay. And so there's this grace period for about mm -hmm. a year or so, but just getting everybody in th to get that bridge training. And maybe that will change if they have challenges, right? Like this is where as agencies, you provide feedback if there are any challenges to getting people in and certified. I believe, I don't know the length of that training yet, um, but I'm pretty sure that they're going to be offering it digitally mm -hmm. as well. So, and there might even be a chance I'm, one of the trainers, I wonder if there's something we could do or even we could do it for new journey. So there could be some options where we could really make sure that we get everybody in mm -hmm. as well. So. Okay. Okay. Tamara had a question in the chat. Yeah. Oh, a little bit about what you say when introducing the peer. Yeah. So one of the, it I tailor it depending on who I'm talking to. But uh, the kind of key things that I always say is, you know, we have a peer specialist. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a person that that they have lived experience. They have an understanding of what it's like to go through hard things or to have system involvement. And their role is really to hear your voice and to make sure that you have a voice in this process, to make sure that you understand all the things that people are saying and that your voice is represented in your treatment and in all the work that we all as a team get to do. So I focus on their voice, support, and empowerment. That's kind of the elevator speech. And from there, I may tweak it depending you know, on peer and the peer specialist. But it always focuses on voice, empowerment, and support. We have time for one more question. Anyone have other questions?
I have one more, I guess, if no one else is going to ask. Um, so thinking about the core competencies you described and, you know, the typical scenario of, you know, peers who kind of go through this, the certification process and then come in to work with an, a new journeys team, where would you say are some of the areas that we really, as a training team, need to focus on in um, helping peers kind of make that leap into a team-based model like New Journeys versus working as an individual peer in an, in an agency? Yeah, I think clear role def or like definition. So really being clear about what is the peer's role and making sure that they have clear tasks and enough autonomy and knowing that so that they can fulfill their role, right? Knowing that do I have the opportunity to do these kind of things, creativity? Do I have, you know, some peers have a budget within the agency where they can get art materials or different things like that. So I think, you know, the peer knowing very clearly what kind of activities they can and can't do. And then also knowing everybody's roles. I should be able to have an elevator speech about every single role on the team so that I can translate that to the individual I'm working with. And so that I know this is something I can support you with. This is something they can support you with. So if somebody's talking about something regarding employment, I can say, well, how about I help you plan that out? When are you meeting with so-and-so on the team? Let's get prepared. What do you want to meet with them on? So I should be able to strengthen some of the work that other folks are doing and help them prepare to have a voice and to come to those meetings or to potentially do some follow-up and check-ins. So I think clear role definition and knowing the what are the boundaries for what I can and can't do like in the community and office and those things. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Lauren. We appreciate you doing this today. Yeah. Definitely um, appreciate the update to, you know, from the last time that you presented and a lot more, you know, other details too that I think were really important for us to reinforce. So thank you.